Welcome uh, to this session on dignity and human rights across disciplinary dialogue between ethics and law. I'm Michael Moreland. I'm a law professor at Villanova University outside of Philadelphia. And it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, participants, and they'll have a dialogue uh, back and forth uh, for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers from the audience. Uh, first, Paolo Carrazza is professor of law at Notre Dame Law School and concurrent professor of political science with particular expertise in the areas of comparative constitutional law, human rights, law and development, and international law. He is also the director of the Kellogg Institute for International Studies here at Notre Dame, an interdisciplinary university-wide institute focusing primarily on the themes of democracy and human development, where he is the principal investigator of the Notre Dame Constitutionalism and Rule of Law Lab. Turn this off. Is it? Oh, okay. Professor Karatza currently serves as the United States member of the European Commission for Democracy Through Law, also known as the Venice Commission, the Council of Europe's expert advisory body on issues of constitutional law, the rule, constitutionalism, the rule of law, democracy, and fundamental rights. In 2016, he was appointed by Pope Francis to be a member of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. And in 2019 to 20, he was a member of the US State Department's Independent Nonpartisan Advisory Commission on Unalienable Rights. In 2019, Notre Dame awarded Professor Kratza its Reinhold Niebuhr Award for Notre Dame faculty whose body of academic work and life promote or exemplify the area of social justice in modern life. Clemens Sedmak is Professor of Social Ethics and Director of Notre Dame's Nanovic Institute for European Studies at the Keough School of Global Affairs. He is also a concurrent professor at Notre Dame's Center for Social Concerns. Before coming to Notre Dame, Sedmak was the F.D. Morris Professor of Moral Theology and Social Theology at King's College, London. He has held multiple positions at the University of Salzburg, serving as Director of the Center for Ethics and Poverty Research and Chair for Epistemology and Philosophy of Religion. He was also President of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Social Ethics in Salzburg. Professor Sedmak's research interests include social ethics, the Catholic social tradition, and issues of poverty and justice. His research includes collaboration with Notre Dame colleagues on the Catholic Church's role in acclimating refugees into Italian society. And with that, I will turn it over to Professor Crozza. Can I just use yours? Oh. He'll turn it up. Okay. Now I all right. I hear it's working now. Can everybody hear me? Even way over on my left. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. You know, it's a it's a hard act to follow by Alistair McIntyre, um, and uh, in the afternoon on Friday, uh, no less, after uh, a lot of really super interesting panels in the morning and yesterday, and so forth. Um, hopefully we'll be able to re retain at least a little bit of your attention uh, during this time because we're going to do something that's really pretty different from most of the presentations and certainly from the invited lectures uh, that are typical at this conference this year and, and other years. In other words, Clemens and I don't have prepared papers here. 
Um, we've deliberately kept this relatively unstructured and going to have a certain kind of dialogue around a set of questions uh, for us um, that, I'll, that I'll try to lay out uh, for us a little bit more. Um, it's even nicer for you to come after Alistair told you that what we're going to talk about really is all wrong, ex ante. <laughs> Um, because, you know, of course, we're dealing with that, that the constitutionalist's version of dignity here um, uh, uh, that, that, is, um, that is, in his view, quite mistaken. Um, and maybe we can revisit that in the, the Q&A or something anyway. But, um, but the fact is that um, from a jurist's point of view, right, a legal scholar, um, I, I, and, and a scholar of human rights and constitutional law, I, I see human dignity, the appeal to human dignity is everywhere. Right? It's pervasive. The, the whole modern human rights project is grounded in this appeal to human dignity. You see it in all of the documents. You see it in all of the preambles. Um, you see it in uh, the justifications that are used uh, for, the, for the agreement around dignity. You see it in the judicial work of interpreting the rights. And dignity is the, the functional ground on which rights are uh, interpreted, expanded, invented. Um, recognized and and so forth. So so it is everywhere. Um, but but Alistair was certainly right in, in at least as much as in saying this, that the appeal to dignity in the human rights sphere masks disagreement, and it did so from the start. And it was intentionally appealed to from the start, in part because it could mean many different things and be grounded in many different ways to the different interlocutors around the table. Uh, this was why Maritain said, yes, we can agree on the rights as long as nobody asks us why, right? Um, because it's with the why that all the disagreements begin. So you appeal to dignity. It's a concept that, that you know, could, was um, uh, appealing enough to reach a consensus around a, a, a great differences uh, of approach, um, and, uh, but not specific uh, so much that, uh, that then it would provoke the why questions and the disagreements. So the end, the end result, of course, is that we have an idea of dignity that's everywhere in human rights, and yet at the same time is, from a theoretical point of view, uh, um, a philosophical point of view, an extremely thin concept, right? Very unelaborated, very uncertain, very um, polysemic, if you will. And, um, and so there's, there's a gap, let's say, between dignity in the practice of law in human rights and constitutional law, and dignity as a theoretical or philosophical concept elaborated at a, in a, in a, through sort of speculative reasoning, right? But at the same time, you know, um, it, uh, unlike many other areas of law, right, uh, whatever, interpretation of the tax code, um, uh, in human rights, there is very little space between the ethical discourse about the human person and the legal rules, right? Um, it's one of the reasons I love teaching it uh, to my students is that, you know, my, my tr whatever, trusts and estates colleagues um, can't easily raise the question every class like I do of, well, really, what is the human person, right? Um, and uh, and in, in a human rights area, you can do that. You can't escape the human dimension. Um, and so there's much less room for sort of the, you know, the prevailing legal positivism that says, oh, these underlying philosophical questions really don't matter. We can bracket them. We can avoid them. We can do law without them. You, you can't do uh, this kind of law because um, uh, we have to be asking what it means to live a flourishing human life and what it means to have just relations in society that, you know, in our norms and institutions. So... So this, this sort of you know, interrelationship yet gap between law and ethics in this area is what I think provoked us a little bit to think about, well, why don't we have a conversation across these disciplines? Uh, what do each of them have to say to each other, in, both in reflecting on human dignity and in and reflecting on the disciplinary differences of, of discourse and thinking about human dignity? So on the one hand, you know, what's the value for law and for the practice of human rights? of engaging in thicker philosophical reflections on the meaning and scope and requirements of human dignity. But conversely, what's the utility of the experience of law and the practice of law for philosophical reasoning about how to enact human dignity? What can we learn uh, by focusing on the meaning of human dignity from the complementarities and the divergences between law and ethics, right? How are they different as well as inter interconnected 
as, as distinctive modes of thought and reflection on reality and on a human person. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is, um, is, is deliberately constrain our discussion not to human rights in its entirety, um, but, but one's very specific human right and one very specific set of, uh, of, of uh, or body of jurisprudence around human rights. And that is Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Okay, Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights is, is very pithy, succinct, right to the point. It says, no one shall be subjected to torture or to inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Right? That's it. That's the entire article. Very clear, absolute kind of claim. Why focus just on this? Well, uh, in all of the disagreements and the divergences around the meaning of human dignity, if there's one human right, one area of law in which there is really effectively universal agreement that this human right is centrally related to the protection of the dignity of the human person, it's Article 3. It's the prohibition on torture and cruel and human and degrading treatment, right? So we deliberately want to start with an area where you know, there is a widespread agreement that, yes, dignity is, is implicated here. Dignity is important. It's central to this. And we see in the jurisprudence of the court of, of, of the European Court of Human Rights, in fact, that they're constantly using the appeal to dignity to try to give meaning and content to Article 3. What does it mean? How do we understand it? What is, what is cruel? What is degrading? What is inhuman? Is, is, is there's a sort of... Um, you know, an appeal constantly to saying, well, this particular practice is very contrary to human dignity, or this is what human dignity requires, okay? So it gives us a, a, a pretty, uh, a, a constrained area in which to, to focus on that. So as I said, we're gonna do this a little bit as an informal dialogue, not entirely structured, um, and we'll see where, where it takes us. Um, our, uh, our, our wonderful moderator, um, introduced us. He didn't introduce himself, so I'll just take the, the a moment to say uh, Michael Moreland knows as much about this stuff as we do, and so I, I hope, uh, Michael, that you'll also jump in and intervene in the conversation uh, as, as well with your uh, background um, in philosophy of law as well as in constitutionalism and other things. Um, Clemens, anything at the outset that you want to say by way of introduction? Just a few words. So it was Paolo's idea. And if you have any questions, ask Paolo. Um, my father was a lawyer. Some of my best friends are lawyers. And uh, so the kind of dialogue we have is we don't look at each other all the time. We look at you. That's Aristotle's definition of friendship, right? You don't look at each other all the time, but you look at the good. Anyway, so um, I'm an ethicist. I'm interested in Catholic social tradition and social ethics. And dignity is a lofty concept. And people sometimes ask me, well, what does it mean on the ground? If the Americans, they ask me, what's the cash value of, of human dignity? And you know, it's, it's contested in the conversation. People have called it a superfluous, redundant concept. If you have a concept of autonomy, you don't need a concept of human dignity. Uh, Steve Pinker, as you all know, called it even stupid. Um, and I understand Alistair McIntyre is also not too fond of it. So it is a contested concept, which also has been called a conversation stopper. I'm really interested in the enactment. I, I'm a philosopher, so I have low self-esteem. And people ask me all the time, what's your method? And I say, I think I have no method. Then they ask me, what, what's your contribution to real life? And I say, well, I have three children. Anyway, so. Um, <laughs> One of the most influential philosophers for me to think about the enactment of human dignity is Avijay Magalit, the Israeli philosopher, who thought about one way to think about when is human dignity violated, and he used the term humiliation. So his idea in this wonderful book, The Decent Society, is a person's dignity is violated if she has reasons uh, to feel um, not respected, or if she, has, if she is humiliated, and she is humiliated if she has reasons to feel violated in her self-respect. And self-respect is the kind of respect I owe to myself on the, being, on the base of being human. So let me try this again. So a person is humiliated if she has reasons to feel violated in her self-respect. Self-respect is the kind of respect I owe to myself on the uh, basis of being human. Not on the basis of being brilliant or poor or rich or whatever, but on the basis of being um, human. And so I'm particularly interested in the concept of humiliation. And that is why uh, I'm interested in Article 3 decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, because degrading um, um, uh, treatment is quite often connected to humiliation and, and this, this, this uh, concept of, of humiliation. Uh, 
So it's actually my hobby. So, so other people have real hobbies. And I love to look at the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, especially when it comes to Article 3 violations, especially if there is no consensus among the, just, uh, the judges and there are dissenting and concurring opinions. And I'm particularly interested, my last remark, to find gems. It's like a treasure hunt, you know, um, um, gold digging. When you find uh, things that are wonderful, and you as a philosopher say, I wish a philosopher would have said that. I'll give you one example. In Winter versus United Kingdom, this is the case where a person after a second murder was um, put in prison uh, without the possibility of parole for a lifelong sentence. Uh, he appealed Article 3 violation. It's humiliating. It's degrading. And uh, Judge Power Ford, in a concurring opinion, said, it's beautiful, I have to read it to you. Article 3 encompasses what might be described as the right to hope. The right to hope. It goes no further than that. The judgment recognizes implicitly that hope is an important and constitutive aspect of the human person. Those who commit the most abhorrent and egregious of acts and who inflict untold suffering upon others nevertheless retain their fundamental humanity and carry within themselves the capacity to change. Long and deserved, though their prison sentences may be, they retain the right to hope that someday, they may have atoned for the wrongs which they have committed. They ought not to be deprived entirely of such hope. And then this beautiful sentence, to deny them the experience of hope would be to deny a fundamental aspect of their humanity, and to do that would be degrading. And that's a wonderful statement, and I love to reflect on these kinds of things. Oh, OK, thanks, Clemens. I'm so glad you started with, uh, with that uh, case and the right to hope, because as beautiful as it is from a juridical point of view, it's nonsense. Well. Right, um, and 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 it exemplifies all the things that I'm worried about. Right, in in uh, in interpreting Article Three with this sort of un, this open-ended, unconstrained reflection uh, ethically on on uh, what dignity requires. I, I'm all in favor of the right to hope, and in fact, I agree that uh, incarceration without the possibility of parole constitutes something that is fundamentally. Uh, um, harmful or an assault on human dignity. But from a legal point of view, it troubles me, right? Here, here's, so let me step back a little bit and say something about the discipline of law, maybe, more generally, and then we'll come back to the, the, the cases and what law has to, to... I mean, on the one hand, I, I think it's wonderful to think of law as not just a set of abstract formal rules, but um, as examples of human experience, lived human experience, right? And much too often, we, uh, we jurists do, in fact, don't, don't take a serious enough account of that. Um, I, I love, there's a, a, a relatively little known, but I think wonderful Italian legal philosopher of the 20th century named Giuseppe Capograssi. And Capograssi wrote about legal experience, like the very category of legal experience. And he says, you know, the law lives and exists in common experience, not separate from it, right? as legal experience, which is realized in the ordinary action of the individual, it's necessary never to lose sight of this simple truth. Um, and, and so I, I, I love the idea that um, the enactment of human dignity, we can learn about it from legal experience as well, notwithstanding the sort of artificiality that law has. But there is, a, there is the other side of that coin too, right? The other side of the coin is that um, as, as, the, as the anthropologist Clifford Gertz put it so memorably uh, long ago in his Tanner lectures, he said, look, whatever law is after, it isn't the whole story, right? Um, law deliberately constrains the scope of inquiry that we engage in. It's not an open-ended, unconstrained ethical inquiry into uh, the good of the particular rule. It, it, it artificially constrains things exactly in order to be able to produce the results of having a rule of law and the attendant service to the common good that that, that, that then uh, leads to. Um, you know, it is, it is again, as, as, Cliff, as Gertz put it, a distinctive way of imagining the real. It isn't all of the facts. It's trying to tell, it's trying to sort of select which things, which features are important in order to be able to then arrive at common standards that can be applied equally, that can be applied consistently, that can be institutionalized, that can have a duration over time. And so it in involves necessarily a certain kind of abstraction from all of the range of facts and all of the full scope of ethical inquiry so that we can have rules, and rules are important for serving uh, the common good. And um, so 
you know, in a, in a developed legal system, we don't usually ask judges to engage in an open-ended, unconstrained ethical reflection about what is good. We ask them to, to apply the law. Now, hopefully the law is informed by a broader, unconstrained ethical reflection, but the judicial work of applying the law is something that is, that is less than that, right? Um, it's not just a question of what is best from an ethical point of view. So given that starting point, you know, what, what can ethics learn from law? Um, you know, and from the practice of law when we're talking about human dignity and, and, and torture and Article 3. Sure. I mean, wh one reason why I became an ethicist was, yeah, I wouldn't like that, you know, to be bound by the law in a way that this restricts your thinking. Judges, though. Judges, I say. Yeah, and lawyers to a certain extent. Oh, of course not. No. Um, so I think what ethicists really can learn is... Um, we don't have that much to offer. If, if you define ethics as the systematic reflection on morality, if you define morality as lived uh, values, and if you define values as conceptions of the desirable, ethics cannot give you the answers. It can give you wonderful questions. It can give you some um, distinctions, some definitions, some aspects, and some arguments. But that's about it. And that is why we have this uh, open, never-ending discussion ethics. And that's one of the things ethics can learn from the judges when they have to arrive at a decision. So, so teaching in Notre Dame means you teach uh, brilliant people. And brilliant people are uh, sophisticated. And sophisticated means it's very hard to arrive at moral clarity where you say this is right and this is wrong. I remember a session taught by Dennis McDonough at the Q School, we asked the students, can you, can you write uh, a memo for the president, uh, should the number of um, migrants that the U.S. would accept increase by 40,000, yes or no? And then he said, and don't give me on the one hand, on the other hand, it's complicated because the president knows that. And they had a very hard time to do that. And so we, we ethicists, we, we tend to be on the one hand, on the other hand, it's complicated. And I admire those judges who have to say, Article 3 violated, yes or no. And that's something we can learn also in terms of the humility to know, well, we, we, we could continue our discussion, but, but uh, uh, a person's life is sitting on our desk and we have to make a decision. So, so that's one. Another big thing that we ethicists can learn from, from the decisions and the judges is the conceptual clarity. So when, when I just think, and I, let, let me just look at the definition of degrading um, in the European Court of Human Rights. Degrading treatment or punishment is characterized as such treatment or punishment that humiliates or debases an individual in such a manner that shows a lack of respect for or diminishes his or her human dignity or arouses feelings of fear, anguish, and inferiority capable of breaking an individual's moral and physical resistance. I don't repeat it because you've got it all. But in, in this very short paragraph, you have wonderful terms, loaded terms, and, and an ethicist would love to unpack that. But that's a big achievement, I think, to arrive at this kind of moral clarity that gives us this food for thought um, that, that is our daily bread as ethicists. Maybe a last remark. Uh, you mentioned the limits of, of, of law. Um, what we have in common is, I think, the respect for the ordinary life and the respect for the community uh, whom we, we should serve as, as, as lawyers and as uh, ethicists. Um, and there are clearly limits to ethics. Ethics. I mean, have you ever read uh, George Steiner's very short uh, essay, 10 Possible Reasons for the Sadness of Thought? Paolo has, of course, but all the others. So it's, it's uh, you have to have a full stomach and be in a good mood to read it. It's, it's a kind of depressive. Uh, ten, uh, well, as the title says, 10 possible reasons for the status of thought. And one reason is it never ends. You don't arrive at a position. It just continues. And there, there is this sense in ethics, it, it never ends. And, and I think that's wonderful that in jurisprudence, well, it has to end at some point. So that's a limit. Another limit in ethics is uh, what John Searle called the gaps. The gap number, he called three gaps. The gaps between evidence and decision. Number one, the gap between decision and action, number two, and the gap between action and the continuation of action, number three. And that's a clear limit of ethics, because even if you say, well, I think this is right, it doesn't mean that you do it, let alone the others whom you, whom you talk to. And I think there is this force of the law that we find uh, impressive, and that's a great learning curve for us uh, philosophers. And just coming back to the definitions, I mean, we, we looked at some of the definitions of the Article 3 uh, terms. That's very helpful for ethics because it makes me th reflect on suffering. It makes me reflect on the role of the body. It makes me reflect on uh, humiliation and the role of intention, and we'll come back to that maybe. Wonderful. So. Um, uh, I, I mean, I love your appeal to, um, to you know, to facts. To, to, so uh, I, I think um, 
it, I think it is, it is the case that law ought to be, is not always, um, uh, you know, involved with the, uh, the, the craft of seeing broad principles in, in very local and parochial facts. Um, and that is the way that you approach ethics as well. But, but I think we both have to recognize that that's not the way that all of our colleagues in human rights and ethics approach these fields, right? And exactly one of the challenges from a, of a, of a juridical approach to, to human rights and, and, uh, and dignity is that is so often it proceeds by vast abstractions without attention to the parochial facts, to the local, to what is in fact human experience, what is the truth on the ground. Um, and, uh, and how highly contingent that might be in many circumstances. I think the nature of, of human rights discourse and rhetoric has always been to appeal to abstract universals, right, at the expense of the concreteness of human experience. Um, so the way that you and I are approaching it, uh, I, 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 I find a lot of consonance in the way you describe your work of ethics, but we have to recognize that, that you know, in the world of human rights and reflection on human dignity, that that's not always what 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 goes on. Um, uh, let, let's move to you know some of the specific issues that might come up uh, in the course of reflecting on the cases now of Article Three beyond these sort of large methodological or, and disciplinary questions. Um, you know, you mentioned, for example, the question of intention and the definition that you read uh, was you know incorporated really a question of deliberateness. Now, within the law on um, Article Three and torture and human and degrading treatment, the question of intentionality is an intensely debated, controversial question in law. Right? What you know? Does torture have to have a deliberate purpose in order to be torture? Um, some legal instruments say yes, and some legal instruments don't. Um, does there have to be an intentionality to the infliction on of of some sort of um, uh, uh, con uh, uh, suffering? on a victim that, that causes the victim to feel inferior or not, for it to be recognizable as a violation of the obligations under Article Three, Given that law has not resolved this problem, what, you know, could, could ethics help us uh, reflecting on the, the, the role of intentionality and purpose in Article Three around this question and, and, and in, in relationship to human dignity? No. <laughs> I think it's the, okay, uh, the honest response. Um, I mean, what, what our disciplines have in common is what's sometimes called reflective equilibrium. So you, you have the abstract, you have the universal, and then you have the dynamics of the concrete situation. And then you try to connect those two in a creative way. And we'll come back to that maybe, but any judgment then implies an irreducibly subjective element because you have to do it. A person has to do it, connecting the, the universal and the, the concrete in the situation. And that's one of the things why I love this Article 3 case and other cases because these are concrete situations. There's a concrete individual in concrete circumstances and, and the judges have to arrive at a decision. When it comes to a concept like intention, um, philosophy, of course, the whole um, theory of action uh, can offer, again, distinctions and, and clarifications, maybe some definitions. The idea of, the whole idea of an action means that um, you desire a situation B that's more preferable than situation A, and you set the action so that B can be brought about, and you transform A into B. Is that helpful? I don't know. But from a philosophical and ethical point of view, the idea of being aware of what you're doing, of planning your action, uh, creates a deeper sense of ownership of the action. So the gravitas of what you do and the responsibility that comes with it increases with this moment of intentionality, as, as, as most ethicists, um, I, I think, would say. Um, should we briefly talk about the Boyd versus Belgium case? Because it's, it's, it's one of those examples where we have a, a wonderfully concrete situation uh, where a 17-year-old um, youth um, was held at a police station and was provoking the police officer. I mean, 17 year old and, and he did not cooperate to say the least. And then a police officer lost his temper and slapped him. So once a slap here on the, on the cheek. Uh, and the big question is, was that an Article 3 violation? And uh, it, it's an, a wonderful question. Was that the intentionality of the police officer to, to hit him? He did not plan it. He did not go into the situation saying, well, I'm going to hit this person. Uh, he could not anticipate the dynamics that the situation uh, brought about. 
because the way we talk to each other is completely different from the situation at the police station here in, in Belgium. And, and so he didn't plan it. He didn't intend to hurt him. Uh, he Probably there was an absence of intention altogether. And, and um, as you know, there was a chamber uh, uh, decision and a grand chamber decision. The, the chamber decision said no Article 3 violation, and the grand chamber decision said yes. And there was a dissenting opinion, and the dissenting opinion warned about the trivializing of um, Article 3 violations. Um, and they, they do say it's wrong. A police officer should not um, um, uh, hit a person in these situations, but there is this human element, and the level of severity has not been yet attained. And I think intentionality and, and a premeditated act and planning involved would aggravate this point of level of severity more easily um, reached. And so um, this is one of the cases where, for me, that's a wonderful, a stimulating case for an ethicist. If you, if you think of this particular situation and you, you read the judges as they disagree with each other and you have this dissenting opinion, and then you look at the arguments, uh, where do the arguments come from? How much of the biography of the judge enters the judgment? Because there is a subjective element of personal experience, a cultural context, etc., etc. And I find this fascinating. So I do think intentionality counts. Whether we can help you, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was helpful, and, and the brief cases. <laughs> is a wonderful example. I, so, um, uh, and, and it's a wonderful example precisely because finding a violation in the, in the Buid case, this, this you know, uh, un, unplanned, let's say not unintentional, right? Um, but, uh, but the police officer didn't go in with the aim of harming the, the, the boy or, or with, a, um, uh, with, with, a, with a specific purpose in mind of saying, I'm, I'm going to subdue him by, by, um, by um, physically harming him. And, uh, and so it, it really does represent, in some senses, the erosion of the idea that um, the absolute prohibition that Article 3 represents, right? It's always wrong. And the language of the court is, is always, it's, it's an absolute right, it's an absolute right, it's an absolute right, everywhere. And yet, as soon as we start removing intentionality from it and purpose, I, I wonder whether it can still be an absolute right. It becomes something that then um, is, uh, becomes much more contingent, right? Including because of the severity question. I think that leads directly to what you observed about the threshold of severity being implicated. Um, and so, you know, from a philosophical point of view, um, I think it's really, it's, it's helpful and useful to reflect on Buyid and why it's harmful to human dignity. It says something about the face, right? Um, it wasn't just a slap on the arm. It wasn't a slap on the wrist. It wasn't a slap on the back. It was something about the slap of the face that made it distinctively harmful to human dignity. That's a really interesting reflection and has implications, I think, for human rights and human dignity and all sorts of other contested areas too, right? In human rights cases, notably, for example, um, questions about uh, the relationship between human rights norms and the liberty or prohibition on wearing uh, the veil, right, a burqa. Um, the Human Rights Committee says you can't prohibit it. The European Court of Human Rights says you can. Which one's right? About commenting on the same French law. It has something to do, and you see in the reasoning, on the meaning of the face. Um, uh, you know, maybe closer to home, you know, our, our, our struggles over mask mandates, right, have something to do at some level, with the dignity of seeing each other's faces and relating to each other as human beings, right? That has to be taken into account in assessing the threshold of whether an interference with our liberty is justified or not. I, I'm not weighing in on that question, mind you, okay? Uh, but, but saying that, that that should be taken into account. But, but exactly those sorts of ethical reflections to me, again, as I said at the beginning, provoke a certain kind of unease from a legal point of view. Right, um, because uh, if you start saying, "Well, it's you know the right is really contingent um, intention," we can take intentionality out of it. It doesn't matter. It, 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 I don't think it, it remains an absolute right because we don't know anymore what the prohibition is. Right? What exactly is the scope of the prohibition? Who has the right? Who has the obligation? What's the content of the obligation? It turns um, uh, a, a lot more. Turns us more towards the positive dimensions of dignity 
the same ones that Al Alistair McIntyre was talking about and advocating for in his Thomistic version just now, um, which you know is really wonderful. And a lot of the Article Three jurisprudence does turn in that direction, right? Saying not just Article Three prohibits certain kinds of action, places certain kinds of restraints on authority. There are certain things that must never be done to a person, right? Um, that's the absolute. But then they've gone on to say, yeah, but it also requires certain kinds of positive action, certain kinds of you know, guarantees of the conditions that allow for the flourishing of human dignity and that, that will allow for us to avoid the conditions in which people will be humiliated. Those, those kinds of rights can't be absolute by definition, it seems to me, right? They're always contingent on circumstances. So let me, uh, let me give you an example of the kind of a case I'm thinking about, and then I'd love to hear what you have to think about it. Um, uh, the MSS versus Belgium and Greece case, okay? Um, this is a case in which um, a, uh, um, a, a refugee migrant landed first in Greece and then uh, moved on to Belgium, and under the protocols, the Dublin Protocol regarding migrants in Europe uh, for the application for refugee status, Belgium uh, sent the person back to Greece because the Dublin Protocol says you have to apply in, for uh, asylum in the country where you first enter the European Union, right? The problem was that there was a lot of evidence, and Belgium knew of this evidence, that the conditions under which this person was being held in, in Greece were appalling conditions of really severe deprivation and poverty. Had been the case before going to Belgium, was going to be the case after being, I mean, after being sent back to Greece. And so, so, it, you know, so it, it, it links the problem of dignity in Article 3 to extreme poverty and deprivation, um, which you know, interestingly connects it to the jurisprudence of a variety of other tribunals in very different parts of the world. South Africa, Israel, India, all have interesting constitutional cases making that link. Um, but it also you know, raises some difficulties, I think, right? Because now you have an affirmative obligation to say, because Belgium was found to be violative of Article 3, in violation of Article 3, by sending the person back to Greece, right? Um, so now Belgium has not only a negative obligation to say, I'm not going to torture someone, but now I have, I need to protect someone against the actions of a different state that have nothing, but I, and I have no intention to send this person into, you know, uh, it, 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 my purpose is not to make the person suffer, right? Um, so, how do we think about that? Um, I mean, we, we are so grateful in ethics to have positive reference points for dignity, such as the face, the special value of the face. When I read this, this, this line in, in Bouillet versus Belgium about the face, I, I thought, oh, Levinas could have written that. Le visage and the importance of the scent of the person is, is uh, the face. Um, with the absolute right, I mean, we could agree that Article 3 is an absolute right, but we will not agree whether this um, Article 3 is relevant for this particular situation. Ah. I think many people would say, well, if we agree that there is degrading treatment, yes, absolute. But maybe, uh, you know, this, the threshold of severity, I mean, there is disagreement here. Uh, we, we, can, we can talk about that. In the case of poverty, that's a, another second positive reference point for dignity. Um, and that would be one of the places where, where Catholic social teaching and, and uh, this kind of jurisprudence could come well, could align with each other. So I'm thinking of Gaudium in Space 26, where it's, it's, uh, it talks about the non-dignified living conditions. So if people are forced to live in extreme poverty, this is not in line with human dignity. So a person should not be pushed in a situation, or the state should not allow for a person to be in this situation, uh, which does not align with a person's dignity. So the examples, let me look at this. Um, when they talk about subhuman living conditions uh, as an insult to human dignity. And so what, what MSS versus Belgium uh, found out was, well, this person lived in appalling poverty. Uh, and on top of the poverty, there was fear and anxiety. And you, you don't think that a person created in the image and likeness of God, my language, uh, should live like that. And that we, we, we should allow states or social systems uh, to develop in a way that people can live under those circumstances. And one of the most painful things about poverty, which, which really doesn't go together with dignity, I think, is what could be called moral distress and moral stress. Um, a, a famous book in poverty studies is Carolina Maria de Jesus and her diary from the 1950s. So she was a single mother of three children in a favela in Sao Paulo. And a journalist discovered that she was writing a diary and he published it. And, and 
in this uh, diary and journal, she makes many remarks about, I would like to be a good mother, but the stressful conditions do not allow me to be a good mother. So, so you have s uh, well justified moral standards, and you cannot live up to those standards because of the circumstances you are forced into. And I'm grateful for this judgment. There are a few others. We discussed one in, in a workshop just, just this morning uh, about a, a Russian woman whose pension was too low to, to allow her a certain living standard. Um, I'm grateful for those judgments because they remind us of the positive obligation to make sure that people do not end up in this kind of appalling poverty. Um, I, Michael, I know that we're getting close to the end of time, so there, 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 okay. <laughs> well, uh, so Don't let me read one, one other one other question, but maybe yeah. this can be a, a concluding one before we go to, to dial, a broader dialogue with all of you as well. Um, and, and in it, I, I guess I want to return to some extent to the question of concreteness and abstraction that I, that I raised earlier and you commented on. One of the interesting lines of jurisprudence within Article Three cases, it seems to me is um, when the, the judges are basically saying, look, in order to assess whether the threshold of violation to dignity is, uh, the violation of is, is severe enough to, uh, you know, to arrive at a violation of Article Three, cruel and human degrading treatment, um, we need to really look at um, the context of what's going on, right? Um, we can't just treat it saying, well, you know, the return of, um, of refugees to a problematic situation uh, where they might face some sort of harm or, or danger or suffering is always wrong. Rather, we have to look in a highly contextual way at, well, who are they? What are the conditions? Um, what kind of opportunity was given to them, right? In some cases, even though the conditions are bad, uh, what the court is looking at is, did the, did the, uh, did the uh, plaintiff have sufficient opportunity to make her case, like in the Jabari versus Turkey case, right? Um, and I, I, you know, this contextualization on the one hand seems to me um, absolutely right, right? I mean, it's, when we talk about human dignity, it is lived in very specific circumstances. It's lived, even in, again, McIntyre was sort of bringing this out indirectly. It's lived in our relationships. It's lived in the small places as Eleanor Roosevelt put it, close to home, um, in the places where we work and the places where we're educated and so forth, and it's in those specific contexts. And, and as much as I, I love that, and that seems to me quite true to me, um, it, I, I don't know how we construct a rule of law out of it, right? And, and I, as a human rights lawyer, I, I want dignity to be the grounding of a set of rules that are clear enough to be able to be applied generally and institutionally and structurally so that we have systems of protection of human dignity and human rights and not just ad hoc decisions saying, well, let me take, you know, Mikhail's case and I'll treat you just on your term, but Susie, I'm going to take your case separately and treat you just on your terms. We have no institutionalized protection of dignity at that point in a certain sense, or at least we lose something. Now, you, you think a lot about institutional ethics as well in your work. So, the, so the, the, the last question for me at this point is, how do we take a highly contextualized, human-sensitive approach to these questions of human dignity and torture and dignity, and, and also not lose the capacity to have an institutionality to them that allows us to protect them and protect the common good at a generalized level. Hmm. Maybe three points. One is in defense of contextuality, I think there is no other way to do justice to a person uh, than to look at the particular circumstances of the, of the situation. In the Jabari versus Turkey case uh, about an asylum seeker from Iran who was afraid of being sent back to Turkey, uh, to Iran from Turkey, and uh, the argument was you apply too late for asylum, we have a five days rule, and the court said a mechanical application of the rule is not doing justice to the situation. And in medical ethics, we sometimes say give every case the chance to be a unique case. So there, there, there is, I think there's no, no way around respecting contextuality and, and those thick descriptions where, where we can benefit so, so much from, from those decisions. Having said that, I don't think that looking into a context would deprive us of um, reference points beyond the situation. I mean, you know, situationist ethics is one extreme. And I would in no moment, uh, in no moment say that's what the judges do, situationist ethics. That's, 
they don't do that. They have very clear reference points, and every decision becomes another reference point. And, and so you have what uh, Robert Brandon called discursive commitments. So with, with, with any statement you make now, you limit the space of discur discursive statements in the future if you don't want to be called a self-contradictory person. So I think these reference points are so helpful, and law is this living instrument, as the Tyra versus UK case in 1978 pointed out. And so I, I like this idea. It's a living instrument, so it develops, but there are these reference points as well. And now on an institutional level, um, I believe in, in procedural responses to concerns. So what, what I do regularly is I ask uh, students, uh, where do you see entry points for humiliation on campus? So explaining humiliation and human dignity and the connection I see with Margalit and others, where do you see entry points for humiliation? And we once did it in a, in a hospital in, in Salzburg, uh, where we asked patients, where do you see entry points for humiliation as a patient? And they mentioned three things. They mentioned lack of privacy. In a room, where you have four beds, and there is, um, A, people visiting others, and, and you have to hear and listen in what others are saying. And there is one, one bathroom, which is not soundproof, and people you know, relieve themselves, and you can overhear that, and they say that's humiliating. Secondly, they said uh, bodily shame, nakedness. Uh, you have to undress how long. Uh, and sometimes, you know, people are stark naked in a little cubicle, and there's this curtain, and if a person passes by, the curtain moves, and everybody sees the person. And thirdly, uh, instrumentalization or objectification, the doctor's rounds. If you have a problem here, everybody stares at this part of your body, and it could be much worse, frankly, uh, at this part of the body, forgetting that there's more to the person. And so... Okay. <laughs> they are laughing, so it's uh, a, a pain in a good sense, I guess. <laughs> yes. So, um, having established having established a map of these entry points for humiliation, there's always this subjective element. We will say, well, I cannot help you with the doctor's rounds. We will continue with the doctor's rounds. But for an in for an institution, it's good to be sensitive to that, and then you could ask for a protocol. Well ask for these entry points and then work with those, you owe us at least a response. So that, that would be my uh, way of institutionalizing it, making sure that, that institutions have this dignity sensitivity where on the different levels of where we are, you know about entry points of humiliation, custodians. Um, I'm writing a book on institutional ethics now on the basis of uh, interviews with custodians. And they have a particular outlook on an institution, little things like, well, people don't greet me. And maybe you know Florence Aubenas, a French journalist, um, who worked six months in the low-income sector as a, as a custodian. And she, she uh, tells us about one situation where she was cleaning a big office, and the office was empty, and she was vacuum cleaning the floor, and then the office door opened, the man and the woman, uh, woman came in, and the man closed the door and said to the woman, finally, we are entre nous, and can talk without being disturbed. And here she was with the vacuum cleaner, as if she was nothing and nobody. And that's humiliating, also by Avisha Magalit's standards. And so looking at institutions from below, I think, is, is a very fruitful exercise, where you don't have to construe a legal case right away, but you can, you can construe some more reference points. Thank you so much, Michael. I can't, I can't yeah, resist adding ahead. one tiny Try. thing, because this is very, this is very stimulating provocation. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention, I mean, at one point, I had the very odd experience of being um, uh, called to be an expert witness in um, uh, a, a class action litigation going on in New York State in which prisoners were suing the state of New York for the indiscriminate use of strip searching. And I was an expert witness on the meaning of human dignity. <laughs> It's a very strange position to be in, right? Um, because uh, from a legal point of view, um, foreign law in US courts is, is considered a question of fact, not a question of law. And so you, you bring in expert witnesses to testify to what the facts are, the facts of foreign law. So I testified to this, the foreign law of dignity as it might relate to the question of nakedness and strip searching. And, and, I, and I mean, what you've given me now actually um, helps me make sense of what we did in that case, in fact, um, from a theoretical point of view. So maybe it is a good point to close on because it, it helps to show how these uh, disciplines do inform each other and, and help each other. Because the difficulty in talking about dignity in that context, in, the, in those, that set of cases, is that there was a multiplicity of different plaintiffs in this class, some of whom were trying to bring dangerous weapons into the prison, and some of whom were just, you know, being stripped naked and in a way that was visible to other prisoners or visible to guards of the opposite sex, primarily as a way of saying, we're exercising control over you and don't you mistake it, right? Um, and so the difficulty was trying to sort out, you know, the, the contextualization of what was going on, 
but also to do so in a way that going forward from below, as you put it, could help to inform institutionally the practices of dignity in these prisons in a way that said, yes, the guards and the other prisoners do need to be protected against the drugs and the weapons coming in. But no, it is absolutely wrong to be doing so in a way. And there are ways to limit the humiliation, uh, the degradation, the, the, um, the, you know, the improper uh, subjection of authority designed to, to put down and to dehumanize. So thank you. Great. Well, we have a lot on the table uh, to discuss if, uh, if people have questions. So we have about 22 minutes, so I think we have plenty of time if uh, people have particular questions. I'll recognize you, and if you could just briefly introduce yourself uh, and then, and then pose a question. Should we pass around the mic or, or not? Uh, if, yeah. Should we pass? Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. I'm Susan Balstein from Franciscan University. I was wondering whether this article has, have, if anyone has ever tried to apply it to experimentation on still living babies that have been aborted. As far as I know, no. <laughs> quite, uh, quite, quite simply, I don't, I don't know that that case, uh, even in the earliest stage, procedural stages of, of uh, law has ever been brought forward. Um, the way that the international systems work in general, including the European system, is that such cases need to be brought within the domestic legal systems first, and all of the domestic remedies that might be available need to be exhausted at that domestic level before they can come. So the first question would, would be, you know, are there constitutional systems in Europe in particular where, where that has happened? But even at that level, I'm not aware of any, but uh, there, there, there might be. Right in back. And maybe it's easier if you just give your question. I'll just sort of, for the recording, maybe just uh, uh, repeat it. So uh, uh, this is, I, I'm, I'm Philip Sloan. I, I would like to ask you a question following up on the point you made about the prisoners. Because it seems to me the problem we have in the United States is we don't have an Article Three, As far as I know, what do you see as giving us some kind of safeguards or do you see anything that would prevent torture, argue, Abu Ghraib prison issues that were waterboarding and so forth that have come up in recent years? And also, having worked in prison uh, environment, I know these cases which are uh, sometimes horrendous about humiliation of prisoners, which there's no appeal that they seem to have. And we, as people even entering those prisons, can't raise those questions without essentially being banned from the prison system. So I just wonder if you had any reflections on that as an American U.S. Situ situation. Um, well, Phil, that, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So I, I think it, to, to my lights, uh, from what I see, um, you know, the, the federal constitutional protection against you know um, cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment. Um, as important as it is, is is not sufficient to address the range of problems that we see and experience in the U.S. Uh, prison systems in, in in so many different ways. Um, so uh, so you know how, how how do we address that? I mean, for my part, I, you know, I would prefer in an in ideal circumstance, in, in related to things we've been talking about, that it not be done just by broader judicial action of interpreting Article 8 even more broadly and saying, oh yeah, we think that's, you know, that's cruel too. Um, but, but, but because I, I, in some senses, I think that lets us as citizens too much off the hook, right? I think it should be done through democratic processes. But, but because, you know, in, in the way the democratic processes, uh, properly speaking, are designed to bring out uh, a common debate, a common awareness, information, persuasion, um, the, you know, the virtues of citizenship um, directed towards serving human dignity and the common good. We can't allow human dignity just to be the province of judicial action because we will never be a humane republic if that's the case. And this is a perfect example of that. Do I, do I remember correctly, did the Senate's ratification of the Convention on Torture, I think, demurred from domestic application of it? So that, that's been true of every human rights treaty that has ever been ratified by the United States. It's always been ratified subject to a provision that says it may not be directly applicable in U.S. courts without legislative implementation. Right. I don't think in principle that's a bad thing. The problem is that the legislative implementation has not always followed. Two, two quick remarks. Um, one is, 
Um, it happens in Europe a lot that major moral decisions are pushed from politics into jurisprudence. And then the judges have to make a decision, and they do not want to be in this position, but that's where politicians quite often sue each other, et cetera, et cetera. Second remark, I think when it comes to, to your point about um, Article 3 um, equivalent in the US, the Catholics would have, uh, I think, a major role to play. I remember an article by Jeremy Waldron from 2006 in Theology Today, where he said, uh, and it, after 9-11 and the waterboarding you mentioned, you know, the, the kind of weakening of the absolute prohibition of torture, he said, the Catholics understand what absolute means. They should bring that into the discourse. They are too much absent from the public discourse when it comes to these very important questions where the European court would have an Article 3 with all its weaknesses and problems. But I think an understanding of absolute, and absolute is such a, it means never. And that's painful. And we had this case, Gefgen versus Germany, where, where you know, that, that there was this 12-year-old um, boy who was abducted and killed. And they, they, they found one of those who kidnapped the boy and thought he would still be alive. And then one police officer threatened Gefgen with, let's say, robust interro interrogation methods. And the Article 3 case, and, and the European court said, it's right. Uh, Article 3 in this case was violated, even if this person did the most atrocious things and was clearly guilty by any human standards, he is protected by Article 3. That's what absolute means. And it's so painful if you are the father of this boy and that that's what's happening. So this, 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 this absolute. I remember, well, I shouldn't talk too much, but I remember Philippe Foote's famous thought experiment. If... Um, Thought experiment. There is a bomb in a kindergarten, and the kindergarten is locked from the outside, and you have the guy who planted the bomb and could disarm it with the code. When would people be inclined to torture the guy to get the bomb disarmed? And she, she said it depends on the number of children in the kindergarten, the age of the children, well, that's what she said, and the time. If the bomb explodes at 12, 11.55, you get nervous, as our chair is getting nervous at 4.14. And, and then absolute means really never, ever. And if you look at the UN Convention Against Torture, it really it makes, it gives you examples. Even if this, this and this is the case, no torture. And that's where Catholics, I think, have a lot to contribute. Yeah, so, so one, one last um, gloss on that, too. Um, that, that's exactly why I, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit worried about the expansion of the use of dignity to expand Article 3 into realms that where the right cannot be plausibly considered absolute, right? Exactly because of the possibility that it weakens that kind of protection. That's the first point. The second point about Catholics and dignity, I'll just say it, you know, Gosh, do I dare to say something, that, you know, to, to disagree with the master, you know, with Alistair. But um, uh, Alistair's uh, history of dignity, I, I don't think was, I don't think it's sufficiently accounted for the Catholic history of dignity. Um, you know, as he put, as he he recognized that the, the 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 dignity language in the Irish Constitution didn't just appear ex nihilio; it came from somewhere. But um, but he, the, the, where it came from is richer, even richer than what he was accounting for. I think, and I say that only to reinforce that um, that there there is a I think a desperate need for us. You know, this is the Center for Ethics and Culture. The Nicholas Center is devoted to Catholic intellectual life. So here it needs to be said, um, it, there's, a, there's a rich contribution that it can make and that we need to be making in order to address these problems for, for, as Catholics in society. So again, I'll, I'll kind of repeat the questions uh, for, for the recording. So uh, first here and then uh, over here, Eric Clay. So go ahead. It was another podium we had to get. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. I think it's because of a cold climate. <laughs> so it's about the questions about uh, recidivism uh, from a comparative perspective and different treatment in prison. I, so I don't know about, enough about the Norwegian uh, legal system. I, I, I am reflexively um, uh, hesitant to accept arguments that the Scandinavian countries, by virtue of being Scandinavian countries, are always more humane in their, in their actions. <laughs> Um, I, I find lots of contrary evidence to that in a variety of fronts. So I don't know about prisons. It could be. But I will say this. Just two weeks ago, we screened uh, as a world premiere at the Kellogg Institute uh, a short documentary that was 
absolutely extraordinary, and I recommend that all of you see it when it becomes public. Um, it's called Unguarded, and it's a documentary about an alternative to prisons in that that were founded first in Brazil and now have spread to you know twenty or thirty other countries around the world, where the recidivism rate goes from somewhere in the ninety percentile to you know the teens, right? Um, based on uh, how the prisoners are treated. There, they're treated with love. They're treated with respect for their dignity uh, in a very comprehensive sense. They're given, they're given work and skills, and they live in an environment, as the title indicates, that is unguarded, right? These are often uh, inmates who have committed very violent crimes. Um, and so it, it is the case. I know that it's the case because I've seen these facts on the ground that human dignity can be transformative of these things. I mean, a respect for human dignity, um, love. Uh, and, and, and that's, you know, that's where the, the, the distinctive way that Catholic social thought approaches the question of dignity is absolutely critical to saying, what is it, how, how does it cash out? What's the cash value when it comes to actually, you know, being transformative of social relations and institutions? I mean, we, we do know Halden prison in Norway and, and the, the statistics, they are quite positive. And, and they try to be a very humane prison with the line, if, if the person leaves prison at some point, he or she might be your neighbor. And what kind of experience do you want this person to bring to your neighborhood? So make it as close to ordinary life as possible. I think that that's one distinction. In Europe, we are not famous for for-profit prisons. And I don't know about your ideological points here, but, but I think the incentive structure for profit prisons is not in line with my understanding of human dignity. I don't so, <laughs> Professor Clays, and then over here. So, Professor Clays. Yeah, Eric Clays, George Mason uh, the Law School. I have a question for each of the panelists, because both of the questions relate to the way in which legally binding texts are interpreted before they're applied. When I heard Professor Peraza's remark, I'm, as an American lawyer, I'm used to hearing about, in constitutional law, originalism and the living constitution and the, the statutes. There is textualism and purposivism. I could, I was not, I couldn't place within those categories the kind of interpretations you were making in Article 3 and other uh, international documents. So I'm curious uh, how, like, what do you think the right method is for interpreting a, a text and how does it relate to And then for Professor uh, Stedmach, when you are crit uh, critiquing the cases that the two of you talked about, were you doing so as an imagining that, that the judge is like King Solomon is not bound by any text and saying what the judge ought to do on these facts without regard to a text? Or were you, you uh, making these decisions knowing that Article 3 or other relevant texts control what the judge would do? So a question about texts and interpretation and application in legal systems, uh, including American constitutional interpretation and then in, in a European context. So Yeah, so thank, thanks, thanks, Eric. Um, uh, so, I mean, when we're talking about, so I'm going to talk about international texts, right, treaties uh, principally. Um, and the discussions about originalism simply don't, aren't present. They don't enter into that discussion at all, at no point, right, no one. Um, uh, and, and in part, it's because um, uh, it has, you know, the, the interpret, there's a lot to be said here. And, and you know, a little comparative law class, I don't want to waste the time doing that. Um, so I'll just be sort of summary. Um, the interpretation of treaties comes out of the civil law tradition. The civil law tradition is not oriented towards an originalist interpretation of text. It never has been since Roman times. Um, and uh, secondly, the, the, you know, the prevailing rules of interpretation of treaties are oriented in some extent towards purpose. The object and purpose of the treaty is one of the criteria that needs to be taken into account. Um, and, and there are other things that lead to sort of a dynamic interpretation of treaties in a way that you know, in the US, many of us find problem, would find problematic if applied to the Constitution for reasons of democratic theory and democratic accountability. Um, now, in the, in the, in, I will say that in the international sphere, and Article 3 is a great example, um, this purposive, dynamic, evolving interpretation has gotten so out of control in the view of many, right? Um, it is so unrelated to the original text that um, there is a great deal 
of resistance arising from the ratifying states, right? Because the states ratified Article 3, a treaty with Article 3, and they thought that they knew what they were approving, that they were agreeing to, and they thought they knew how it was going to be interpreted, at least within some boundaries, even accepting a dynamic evolving interpretation. And now they find themselves with, you know, a host of constraints on, for example, their rules on deportation, which could never have been envisaged, envisaged as part of Article 3. So, so the, the, the distinctive way in which the arguments over interpretation play out in the U.S. system are, are you don't find a... A, an, an easy um, resonance in the international sphere, but there's increasingly, I think, um, voices of concern and criticism about just how unconstrained uh, the dynamic interpretation is that uh, that uh, human rights judges engage in, for the reasons that I was mentioning. Yeah, maybe maybe three brief remarks. The, the lang I, I hope it came across. The language game I was playing was learning from Strasbourg. I mean, I, I wasn't critiquing the judges and the decisions. Uh, and, and so for me as an ethicist, it's really stimulating and, and food for thought. And I, I don't, you know, um, have this moral arrogance to say, well, this is what I would have done. And this is what they should have done. So I hope this came across because I didn't critique the, the, the judges. Um, Article 3 is so short, as Paolo pointed out. I, and then you have torture, degrading, inhuman treatment in, in one little line. So even if you say that's the text, the text doesn't give us much. Uh, it's like the beginning of the Gospel of John. I mean, the, the, the verse one doesn't give us much, but it gives us so much. Anyway, um, thirdly, that's where these reference points, when, when I look at the Catholic Magisterium and, and paper documents, they quote paper documents. And, and so it should be. The European court quotes European court documents. So there's this magisterial element to it where you have reference points and then you work with these reference points, what I called discursive commitments before. But, but what Paolo just said makes it very clear that we, we moved away from the original intent or the original context. And, and even if you recognize it's a living instrument, um, there is this sense of maybe we must have another really fundamental discussion about where are we now, where would we like to be, uh, where lawyers and, and people like you and Paolo are, are necessary, just to remind us of, it cannot be left you know, to, the, to the judges who, who have many things to decide and then they may overlook because they, they, they have two days or three days or a week. Just, um, because it is worrisome. Uh, on one hand, on the other hand, which deal would we get if we tried to have another European Convention on Human Rights today? It's like the Geneva Convention on Refugees, 1951. Let's just not open that today because the deal we would get in, in, in 2021 or so. Well, anyway, that, that's where I'm coming from. But I really did not criticize the judges. I think we probably have time for one more question. So right here, yep. Human rights in crisis to take us out uh, for the rest of the session. Maybe Michael can start. <laughs> yeah, really. You haven't said anything yet, Michael. Um, I'll turn it to you. Um, well, um, um, yeah, yes, I believe, I mean, so much to say. Um, yes, I would agree that in many ways uh, the, the ideal and the project of human rights is in crisis. Um, uh, but, um, you know, Crisis, uh, even according to its original meaning, right, is an opportunity. It's, it means you have to discern, right? You have to, it's, it, it, you have to enter into it and make judgments. Um, and uh, so, I, I, I would not draw from the question, from the observation of crisis, a conclusion that the human rights system needs to be rejected, right, or dismantled or abandoned. 
um, because uh, there is a, actually a great deal of good that is done uh, in, in that. And a lot of the reason that it's in crisis is that there are 4 billion people who are living in authoritarian states in the world. And I, I, that's not an exaggeration, right? Um, so yes, we can, you know, we, because of the context in which we're in, can, can you know, can rightly uh, fret and worry about uh, the fact that, um, you know, the language of human dignity and human rights is being used to justify, you know, uh, the, the euthanizing of the weak and disabled and elderly. Um, but the fact is that, you know, for 4 billion people in the world, we need to be talking about human rights. We need to be strengthening the human rights system. We need to be committed to the basic ideas of human rights because they're living in conditions in which, you know, the, their, the, the, the basic liberties and physical conditions of their life are being suppressed every day. That's the real crisis. Now, it's not unconnected to the crisis that you're mentioning too in that element of crisis in the sense that, and it takes us back to dignity. You know, the, the great project of human rights that was of, of, of building an international regime of human rights and an international system of protection of human rights that was begun in 1948 um, with the Universal Declaration, you know, was done and had to be done on the basis of um, unfinished foundations. Right. I, I don't have any doubt that in the concluding lecture on Saturday night that Marianne Glendon is going to talk about this. Right. So everybody should go to that and hear what she has to say about the unfinished business of foundations of human rights. Um, and we see that in dignity. Right. It, it's it's important that we have the, the reference to dignity as a starting point for reasoning together about human rights. But it's a starting point. It's not an end point. It's not an end point because everybody brings different foundational premises to it, some of which are radically incompatible with others. And Maritain and the others who drafted, he didn't draft, who approved, and those who drafted the declaration and, and argued for it, they knew <clears throat> that it was a bare starting point for reasoning together about the actual meaning of human dignity, right? They never presumed that this, this, this bare practical convergence on some idea of dignity and some rights articulated from it was the end point for our understanding a common standard of justice for one another. It has to be the beginning of it. And that's, you know, that's what brings us back to saying, you know, we have to be engaged substantively in the conversation of what really does correspond to the flourishing of human persons and the justice of human relationships in order to salvage rather than reject the human rights system for the sake of all those in the world who are truly suffering. You should have the last word. All right. <laughs> Great. Well, we're right at 4.30, so please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> <laughs>